the, the stakes are very high. And if Russia prevails here, uh, I think it casts a, a high degree of uncertainty for the rest of Europe here as we move forward. Um, so I think this is uh, this is an important test for us, and it's important for us to get this right and to help Ukrainians uh, repel um, the uh, the Russians and you know restore their their sovereignty over this. Negotiations for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in Gaza have resumed in Cairo. That's according to Egyptian sources. Senior officials from the U.S., Israel, Egypt, and Qatar are meeting as Israel faces strong international pressure to stop its strikes on the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where more than a million civilians have fled. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, has again warned against a full-scale offensive on the city. The people who are in Rafa on many occasions have already moved three, four or five times and it's not possible to move again. They can't go north because they'll be going back to homes that have been destroyed. They can't go south because that would involve going into Egypt, which none of us want to see and the Egyptians don't want to see. And that is why it's so important the uh, Israelis stop and think before uh, going ahead with any operations in Rafa. Well, Joseph Votel is a former four-star U.S. general, a former commander of U.S. Central Command. Good evening to you, uh, General Votel. Yes, good evening. How are you, Carol? Um, very well. Good, really good to have you with us. What do you think about the prospect of a full offensive on Rafa, which still appears to be the Israeli plan? Yeah, I think uh, as as um, as the minister mentioned just a few moments ago here, I think this has to be done with some very careful planning and, of course, a lot of coordination with the humanitarian uh, organizations on the ground. Uh, this is uh, this is going to be an extraordinary operation. Again, you've got uh, over a million Palestinians that are located down in the Rafa area. They've got to they have to go someplace. They have to be safeguarded. They have to be taken care of. So I think, as you've heard political leaders in our country talk about, it's really important that a that a very clear plan for how this operation is conducted is is laid out. And I think that begs for uh, for some patience and some uh, some advanced planning before any type of operation takes place into Rafa. Yeah, we've um, had the uh, top uh, human uh, humanitarian uh, official uh, for the United Nations warning that an Israeli assault on Rafa could lead to a slaughter. I mean, it's impossible, to, isn't it, to see how you could carry out a full-scale offensive on a city like that when you've got so many people who are sheltering there. And, and frankly, as David Cameron has said again today, there's nowhere else for them to go. Right. I, you know, I think you're I think you're just highlighting the complexity of the situation. I uh, this is this is fairly un unprecedented in terms of what we're seeing. I our uh, my own experience, our experience in in Iraq, uh, as we went to large population centers like Mosul. Uh, one of the advantages we did have is we had the support of the Iraqi government, and we had a very good relationship with a uh, with the group of uh, humanitarian organizations that were operating in that area, and that allowed us to actually do some planning with them so that we could establish corridors for civilians. We could establish uh, assembly locations for them to move to. We could ensure that supplies and materials were stockpiled to take care of civilians who would inevitably be displaced as we went in to conduct operations against ISIS. So this takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of coordination. And you cannot, uh, you cannot do this devoid of the humanitarian community. And do you get the sense that Israel is heeding those warnings from um, the US as well as the UK. We've had Joe Biden this week um, talking about the importance of protecting civilians. I mean, we're not seeing any signs, are we, of uh, efforts to try to relocate civilians to another part of Gaza, even if there was somewhere else safe and with hu enough humanitarian supplies for them to exist. Yeah, I think perhaps sometimes the the narrative doesn't necessarily match the actions on the uh, the actions on the ground with this. We have seen Israel respond uh, with this grid system, this uh, uh, system that they use for notifying po uh, the civilian population of areas where they're going to uh, going to be doing operations. And it's an imperfect system, but it, it is a it is an example of how they have responded. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think the the proof will be in the pudding here. Uh, you know, what I will be looking for is we'll be looking for a very deliberate approach to this, and uh, and uh, you know some patience on the part of the Israeli Defense Force, who has a that obviously has a legitimate concern against Hamas, but certainly has to take into consideration the significant uh, civilian population that is down in the Rafah area. And do you get any sense that these negotiations that are going on? Uh, towards another potential pause in the fighting, which we have seen in the past and which did lead to the release of more hostages uh, and indeed uh, some prisoners from Israeli jails. Do you get any sense that there is some real momentum behind these mm -hmm. talks? Well, I can't. I can't really measure the momentum because I'm not in the in the meetings. But the fact that we are continuing to meet, the fact that governments are sending high level officials to this, I think, gives me the indication that we are at least talking. And that, of course, is the most important step to get this started. So, where there is the opportunity for for discussions and conversation, there's also the opportunity for or hopefully some type of solution or some mitigating factors here to minimize the impact on the on civilians uh, to you know. Uh, reach some kind of resolution on the hostage situation and perhaps move this conflict more into the political realm. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and see uh, with this. But the, the, good, the good aspect of this is people are, in fact, talking. Yeah, but we've also seen um, two hostages released earlier this week through a military operation. And President Netanyahu, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, sounding uh, pretty uh, defiant when he talks about the need to uh, destroy Hamas um, so that it can't carry out further attacks. And given the way that they have moved right across Gaza, does it not now seem inevitable that they will want to go into Rafah to try to, to take out the remaining uh, leadership and, and what fighters they can from Hamas? Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, it certainly seems that way. And this is, I guess, what I mean when sometimes the narrative doesn't necessarily match the actions on the ground in terms of that. You know, it's uh, when political leaders make statements like that, eventually that has to get translated into military tasks on the ground that has to be carried out by by soldiers and organizations down there. And that that, of course, is much more much more difficult than that. So it doesn't help that kind of that kind of narrative, that kind of rhetoric doesn't really help in terms of uh, accomplishing the military mission on the ground. It has to be translated. There are plans have to be made. Uh, and it has to be conducted in a way that, of course, uh, that com you know comports with the law of armed conflict. So, yeah, again, I I'm afraid we're, we're going to have to be patient. We're going to have to wait and see how this evolves here. Uh, but uh, but I, I hope I have confidence. I think that the Israeli military will try to do what they know is right here, try to accomplish their military tasks and, and try to do it in a way that at least attempts to minimize the impact on the population. I mean, that's that's what we have to hope for here. Um, let me ask you also about the remarks that we heard from President Trump this week, uh, former president, um, but very much on course to be the Republican nominee once again. And apparently at, the, at this stage of the race, um, favorite to win another term in the White House. And he made those remarks, admittedly, at a political rally when he suggested not only um, that if he were to be um, back in power, it, he wouldn't necessarily deploy U.S. forces to um, support a NATO ally in trouble. And he even suggested that NATO allies that, that don't uh, spend enough on their own defence, well, then he'd, uh, he'd encourage another attack. And tonight we've heard from President Biden. Um, he launched this outspoken attack on Donald Trump over those comments. If an ally didn't spend enough money on defense, he would encourage Russia to, quote, do whatever the hell they want, end of quote. Can you imagine a former president of the United States saying that? The whole world heard it. And the worst thing is he means it. No other president in our history has ever bowed down to a Russian dictator. Well, let me say this as clearly as I can. I never will. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. Well, President Biden uh, clearly denouncing uh, his rival over those comments. And there has been concerns um, right across uh, 
the NATO alliance. Uh, senior figures here in the UK and other European capitals very concerned about it. Are, are you concerned, Joseph, about the signal those remarks might send out about what might happen in future in terms of the US commitment to NATO? Well, you know, I think uh, President Trump's comments speak for themselves here. I, I'm not in the position of of critiquing presidents or former presidents of the United States in terms of this. But what I do know is this, is that the security of the United States is and always has been dependent upon our alliances, upon our coalitions, upon the, our partnerships that we have uh, with uh, with countries uh, across Europe uh, and in many parts of the world. And, and our proven way of operating is through coalition. So we are very, very dependent. And I personally have served in a NATO headquarters. So I am certainly a former American officer, but I consider myself to be a NATO officer as well. And, and while no coalition, no alliance is perfect, uh, NATO gets it right uh, pretty much most of the time. And it's a good alliance. There's good trust back and forth. It's vital for the United States as it is for all the members of, of that particular alliance. And one of its absolutely essential principles is this idea that if uh, one NATO member is attacked, then the others will stand with it and, and, and come to its defence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that 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 goes without saying. That's that's fundamental to the alliance. And it's what we've all recognized. It's important to appreciate that, uh, you know, after 9-11, after our tragedy in our country, NATO and the NATO countries stepped up very very rapidly to support the United States and the attack that had been perpetrated on us. So, yeah, this goes both ways. And uh, and uh, I think it's an important and fundamental uh, concept to our to our overall security. Uh, just finally, um, we've seen this vote in favor of this big packet package of uh, international aid, a, a big chunk of it going to Ukraine. Uh, we know that Ukraine's leadership and its military have been desperate to get more support and more military equipment and ammunition and so on um, from the United States. Um, how important do you think this is as uh, Ukraine faces um, this, this constant battle just to hold back the Russian offensive? Yeah, I, well, I think as everyone has, has, has largely said, this is, this is very important support for uh, for the Ukrainians, and it matches uh, what we've seen come from the European Union and a variety of others here. Uh, and this is a this is a, it is a necessary uh, requirement for us, I think, to support uh, Ukraine so that they can uh, prevail in this conflict uh, against Russia. I think the the stakes are very high, and if Russia prevails here, uh, I think it casts a, a high degree of uncertainty for the rest of Europe here as we move forward. Um, so I think this is uh, this is an important test for us, and it's important for us to get this right, and to help the Ukrainians uh, repel um, the uh, the Russians and you know restore their their sovereignty over this. So I think it's it's absolutely critical for us. Joseph Votel, um, former four-star U.S. general and uh, former commander of U.S. Central Command, really good to speak to you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks very much.